Okay. All right. Good morning. Nice Good to morning. Uh, everybody. Thank you for joining. And uh, just as I'm sure it's on all, all of our minds, we just wish uh, much nechama uh, to the families um, who experienced such tragic uh, losses in their own. And uh, it's a loss for all of Klaus, and hope that uh, the learning that we share this morning um, hopefully is a source of chizuk and um, strength within a shamot and also refuah shalema for all those who are injured. And God willing, um, this week we'll share a Hopefully, in the weeks ahead, we'll see to vote for uh, Klai Yisrael. Um, I am thrilled to uh, welcome Zoom. You can accomplish a lot. I want you to know, yeah, we've got a lot of Zoom Torah. And even though you're not here in person, um, the Torah still will penetrate into our hearts. So we really appreciate you taking the time on Sunday afternoon for us <laughs> on Sunday morning. Um, and... Uh, we thank you for coming. I'm just going to give a quick bio. Um, Yael Leibowitz has her master's degree in Judaic studies from Columbia University. Prior to making Aliyah, Yael taught Tanakh at the Upper School of Ramaz and then went on to join the Judaic studies faculty at Yeshiva University Stern College for Women, where I believe she taught some of my daughters as well. And I learned she was a neighbor of my sister, Hani, in the early years in Teaneck. It's the most important taught, part of my bio. <laughs> that's it. She's taught continuing education courses at Jerisha Institute for Jewish Education and served as resident scholar at the Jewish Center of Manhattan. She's currently teaching at Matan Women's Institute for Torah Learning and is a frequent lecturer in North America and the United Kingdom. Um, we're thrilled to have you. It's part of the Mizrahi program. Um, we know Yomi Rishalayim is coming up, God willing, in about a week. Um, so yeah, El will talk about uh, miracles, redemption in Israel, and uh, God willing, we will see you in Yerushalayim very soon. For good reasons, that's right. And much hatzlachah to you and you and your family. And again, thank you. Um, yeah, I was going to speak for about 40, 45 minutes. There'll be some Q&A at the end and we'll, we'll end about 11 o'clock. So thank you, Yael. Pleasure. And thank you so much for having me. Um, like you said, Rabbi Khan, it's sort of hard to, to switch gears from the mood here in the country and everything that happened Friday, Thursday night, Friday. Um, but I, I, I really do believe, like you said, that on some level, the only, you know, the only thing we can do to try to compensate for the, uh, for the sadness and the tragedy is to try to fill our days, I guess, with Torah and meaning and try to uh, try as best we can to, to tip the scales in that direction. Um, so thank you everybody for coming. I am going to be speaking today about Yom Yerushalayim. I will give you a warning ahead of time. The connection probably, you probably will not see the connection until about the last 30 seconds of this year, uh, but I promise there is a connection. And, and, and the reason I'm building it up is to sort of give us maybe a different perspective on Jewish history and specifically as it pertains to, to Yom Yerushalayim. So in Mesopotamian traditions, Mesopotamia is that massive land between the Tigris and the Euphrates, which was the basically the cradle of civilization, right? Where everything began, where, or certainly where written history uh, began, and certainly all of the cultures that predated Israelite culture uh, comes from Mesopotamia. And in Mesopotamian traditions, they speak about what they call the seven Apkalu, which are these mythical sages. They were half fish, half man, and they were talk about them coming out of the sea to reveal to man the sciences and the social systems, writing and art. And if anyone is interested, I would be more than happy to send you all the different myths about these sort of semi-divine figures. And one of the things that's really, really fascinating is that this phenomenon, or what we call sort of the divinization of these, those that, bestowed upon humanity all of the ways in which we understand now how to use technology, how to use fire, how to use uh, what, you know, sort of what was then considered science. So in the ancient world, one of the things that happened is that all of those secrets were bestowed upon man by these demigods, by these semi-divine beings. And in the ancient world, the advance of culture was always attributed to these semi-divine figures. And again, it was really taken as a given this, you know, one of the things we talk about when we learn Tanakh is we try to understand the, the sort of cognitive landscape that existed. And once we understand that, we can appreciate the revolutionary idea sometimes that the Tanakh is actually conveying to us. So what's interesting and again, I'm not going to go through all of those myths, but they talk about how arts and the crafts and music and scales and balances and, um, you know, all these different the smiths and how iron and fishing tackle were created. All of those were, were, were attributed to these semi-divine figures. And what's fascinating, and I'm going to pop up on the screen here, um, 
and I have the English and Hebrew. I'll be reading mostly, I'll probably be mentioning, uh, saying most of it sort of outside of the sources and just in the interest of time, but you have them for, for your own edification. One of the things that's really, really interesting is that if we look in Breshit, and I hope you can see, I hope the sources are big enough. Um, one of the things that we notice in Breshit is that all of those things that are attributed to these semi-divine figures in the ancient world are actually accomplishments that are credited to human beings. And immediately following in Breshit, immediately following the first murder of Hevel by Cain, which we all know, right after that takes place and justice is meted out, then what we have in Breshit Perak Dalit are all of those line the linear genealogies. We know that the fathers begot sons, et cetera, et cetera, how long they lived. And then in that little source you have there is this brief narrative that provides or tells us about the developments of arts and civilization. And it's sort of interspersed throughout the list. And so we talk about who invented the wind instruments and who invented the pipe instruments, excuse me, the, the string and the wind instruments. And what the Tanakh essentially does is it credits humans. It gives this list of humans with real names, children of real fathers who had their own real sons. And on some level, what this really does, if we think about it, and what I mentioned a minute ago about understanding the ancient world to appreciate Tanakh, this is what we call sort of a silent polemic against the mythological concept that I mentioned a moment ago of euhemerism. It's sort of an argument against the idea that only divine or semi-divine beings can, can, can communicate these brilliant ideas to the world. And what the Tanakh is saying is no, actually human beings create these things. And if you think about it, right, the degree of ingenuity and foresight required for the inventions of these things it is unbelievable. The idea, right, even just something as simple as baking bread, the idea that you could take a seed and you could thresh it into something other than a seed, turn it into flour and add a leavening agent and then add heat. And all of a sudden that, the, the forethought that all of those things that we take for granted were the forethought required, we can understand why in the ancient world, all of those innovations, right? Think about wind instruments, think about any of that stuff. We could understand why in the ancient world they would be associated with the gods. It's almost hard to believe that humanity could come up with those ideas out of nowhere, right? It's interesting. I'll just give an example. If you look at the instruments, they don't list percussion, right? Because percussion, what do you do? You bang on something and it makes a noise. It's intuitive. That doesn't require a god, but the other types of instruments do. And so on some level, by listing the human innovators, by giving the names in Parak Dalid, what Tanaka is doing is historicizing the development of human culture, and in that way, demythologizing very subtly, right? Tanakh never comes and says, nah, -uh, it's not like that. Here's how it is. Tanakh goes in this very subtle way and demythologizes some of the very prevalent concepts that belong to Israel's neighbors. Okay. And again, there's lots of other details here. If you want to look into it, if anyone, I'm more than happy after the class um, to sort of discuss further. If you look there's, there's seven generations of human creativity that parallel the seven days of creation. There's really a tremendous amount that's sort of embedded here in the text. But ultimately, on the most basic level, naming the innovators of science and technology in the ancient world, what Tanakh is really doing is confirming what we're told at the very beginning when humanity was first created. Right? Hashem creates humanity, and then he says, that we were created in Hashem's image. And so by definition, we are creative beings, right? And so Shuha, God is, is commanding us or, or charging us with the responsibility to figure out how to splice and manipulate mRNA to prevent a pandemic from killing even more innocent people than it needs to, right? It means that it gives us the ability to land man on the moon. All these things that humanity is capable of, Tanakh believes in a very, very in, inherent way that humanity is charged with that responsibility and that challenge. And so we see our existence really on this earth as something that's good and fulfilling and something that human innovation and human progress is something that's the result of humanity's ability, inherent abilities. Uh, I'll leave on the side, right? Of course, it goes without saying, and no one, we don't have to go further than Albert Einstein, who, who talks about really the sort of the, what he experienced after, right? The technology for creating the atomic weapons. We can understand that humans' ability for innovating can always be Used, right in the wrong directions as well. But essentially Tanakh is charging humanity with those things that were left to the gods in ancient Near Eastern thought 
and human beings in Tanakh are understood as partnering in God in this on, unfolding, this constant unfolding of history. That's all by way of introduction. Now, when we talk about Tanakh, we talk Chazalte, we talk about the notion of Shivim Panim La Torah, right? That there's a myriad of ways, and this is sort of a central component of our religious system and our belief system, is that Torah and Tanakh can be interpreted in a myriad of ways. And that by definition, because the words of Tanakh are divine, they contain within them unlimited layers of interpretation and meaning. And because that's true, uh, so one of the things that often I think happens is that we get caught up in the homiletics of it, right? And, and, and no offense to, to shul rabbis, of course, but we, we get very, we want to always understand what this text means to me. How can this be applied to my life? What does this pasuk that Yirmiyahu said in the sixth century BCE mean to me in 2021? And that's really, really important. And it's a critical part of the Torah studying process. But what I want to do today, and this is sort of my own bias, just because I love studying the ancient world, is to look a little little bit about at what Tanakh meant on the pshat level. And pshat, I, I think more than any other word, perhaps in the, in the studying Tanakh lingo that we use is one of the most misunderstood words, right? Because if I say to you here, I'm going to open up the chats. There you go. If it's Sunday morning, you had your coffee, everyone has to pay attention. So what does the word pshat mean? Throw out an answer. Stop sharing the screen for a sec so I can see your answers. What does the word pshat mean? You're not going to get it wrong, I promise. Or, or at least you'll you'll get it just wrong enough as everybody else, and then I'll I'll tell you what I actually think it means. <laughs> you could also take yourselves off mute if that's easier than typing in. You don't have to feel the you don't have to silence yourselves. Shot. Right. So I'll throw out a few answers in case people are a little ambivalent. So. Pshat, I think most times, right? People try to interpret the word and they say, so it means simple or it means basic, right? And I think that's, on some, that's not wrong, right? But, but those words are really relatively, are, are on some level relative because something could be simple to me and complicated for you or basic for someone else. And that's why we have all these medieval parshanim that consider themselves pashtanim, right? But they don't all disagree. There's no one answer. Pshat really means, ah, okay, there you go. I don't, hi, Nanshi. Ah, okay, perfect. So that's the perfect, perfect answer. You took the words out of my mouth, right? Pshat means what the text meant to its original audience. That's literally the perfect way to express it, right? It means what the words meant when the people were standing at Har Sinai or the people were hovering around near Miao Hanavi, what the words meant, what they understood when those words were first spoken, how the idioms resonated with them, what metaphors were ancients drawing from or borrowing that don't even make sense or don't even mean anything to us anymore. And so in a lot of ways, ironically, right, we're sort of further from the ancient world today. And yet we're actually in a much better place for interpreting Pshat because over the last, I would say, two, two and a half to three centuries, what, what archaeologists and, and philologists and linguists have been able to discover about the ancient world, right, discoveries of ancient texts and of ancient law codes and the deciphering of ancient texts, sort of the, the concrete historical environment that produced the Tanakh that was lost for, milli for, for millennia is suddenly at our fingertips again. And so cultural references and idiomatic statements and, and the like makes so much more sense to us and we can understand the pshat of Tanakh so much more than we have in a really, really long time. And it's really something fascinating to think about. Also, I always say if, if we do believe in miracles or in the, right, it's not hard to believe in Yad Hashem and the discovery of, uh, in the establishment of the state of Israel, but the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which sort of brought us back literally 2,500 years in time. It was literally a time capsule to Svarim and Tanakh that had been lost to us or sort of in the original form. Uh, and, and not just Tanakh, of course, also extra biblical works. The discovery of the, of the Dead Sea Scrolls just as Israel was becoming a state is, is too hard to write off as, as serendipity. I think. Um, but anyway, that being said, right, so when we're trying to learn Tanakh from the Pshat perspective, so what we want to keep an eye out is for is two things, right? The first, and, and I think this might be clear from the example that I gave about the demigods bestowing humanity, you know, the secrets of innovation on humanity, is a recognition of the notion that while Tanakh is not primarily a polemic work, right? Tanakh is not coming to, uh, to actively, aggressively undermine ancient Near Eastern thought and belief system. It implicitly undermines the prevalent myths of its day, almost as a primary step for then communicating all the revolutionary ideas that Tanakh has. 
Okay. And again, we have to remember, I think sometimes when we use the word myth, it, it sort of has this pejorative, uh, I guess, association, right? Like, oh, a myth, it's a nice story. In the ancient world, myths were essential. They were the means by which really people articulated their understanding of the universe and God's and humanity's place in it. And cultures were literally founded on myths or on ideas that were communicated through myths that were passed down orally from one generation to the next and accepted as a given, much the same way we accept scientific truth in modern times. So, you know, when we say myth, we have to appreciate the gravity of what it meant. And so the more we know, again, about the ancient world, the more we come to appreciate the hidden polemics that are that are embedded in the in the text of Tanakh. So I want to start with one. I know I said there are two things. I'll get back to the second thing we have to keep an eye out for. But I want to start with one myth that you're going to listen to, put on the side, and then we're going to get back to it towards the end of the year. The it's one of the most well known and actually deeply influential myths of the ancient of ancient Egypt. Um, and we know that it actually dates back all the way in its most, at least in the most basic form that we have to the 24th century BCE. Okay, so just to put things in perspective, Avraham is dated to around the 20th century BCE. We got out of Mitzrayim in around the 13th century BCE. So 24th century BCE is a good five millennia before Avraham Avinu was even on the scene, okay? So for a variety of reasons, this myth had really widespread appeal and it appears in, in a lot more ancient texts and any other myth. And it's found really in, in a lot of very, in various literary Egyptian styles, lots of different variations of it, et cetera, et cetera. But we have essentially written versions of this myth from the 24th century all the way through the 13th century BCE. So pre-Avraham all the way through the period of Yitziat Mitzrayim, this myth was being written and circulated and orally passed from one generation to the next, okay? And the myth goes as follows in its most basic form. Again, there's lots of variations of it. You have, it's called the myth of Isis and Osiris. And some of you may even be familiar with it. There's actually some movies based on it. Um, you have Isis, the savior goddess, who gains renown for her successful resurrection of her husband's brother that happened in Egypt. We're not gonna, we're not judging. Uh, Osiris, okay. Osiris there was the, a God, he was initially the divine ruler of Egypt. He was murdered by his jealous brother, Seth. And Isis, after an intensive search and wandering, she finally obtains the body of Osiris and she's able to resurrect him by means of all these magical formulas. Right? Now she becomes pregnant with their son, Horus. And she, who, and she then has to sort of continue to protect from Seth. So ultimately, Horus grows up, he usurps the throne, and he restores order to Egypt after Seth's unrighteous reign. That's the basic myth in a nutshell. Now, Osiris is connected with life-giving power, with ma'at, which is sort of this idea of the natural order in Egyptian culture. And if you had to guess, right, Seth, the one that tried to kill him, is associated with violence and chaos and disorder. And so on the most basic level, this myth symbolizes what a lot of ancient myths symbolize, which is the struggle between chaos and order. Right, the disruption, the disruption of life by death or the competition that speaks between the forces of life and death. Okay? That's the myth in its most basic form. And I'm gonna ask you to shelf it for now. Okay, and we're gonna see in a little bit how the Tanakh actually absorbs and then responds to that myth. But there's a second reading strategy also that I think is, is really, really important. Um, you know, when we study Tanakh, um, I think that one of, the, one of the things that we sometimes do, and I think this sometimes gets people to imagine that academia and Tanakh actually sort of clash with each other, right? If Tanakh is not perfectly historical, then it has, people imagine that it raises all of these questions of faith and all these questions of belief. But I think if we actually understand that Tanakh is not a history work, Tanakh is, Tanakh is not presenting us with history so that we know what happened in the past, Right. In fact, by the way, if Tanakh, if we look for Tanakh to give us a comprehensive history, it doesn't actually do a very good job. Right. If I asked you what happens during the reign of David HaMelech, you could give me a string of about 20 narratives. We don't actually know what happened during his reign. What Tanakh is really doing is Tanakh is telling us about things that happened in our past so that we can begin to understand what the nation of Israel is all about and what our unique relationship with God is supposed to look like. And that goes back and, and what our relationship with our land is supposed to look like. Because at the end of the day, what Tanakh is doing through the narratives that 
it incorporates through the stories about our ancestors that it does choose to include is it has enabled the people of Israel to forge an identity and to understand who we are through the stories of our ancestors. And it's on some level what the Ramban talks about when he says, right, that what happened to our ancestors is a blueprint for the children, not just in a literal way, because Yaakov went down to Mitzrayim and his children will go down to Mitzrayim, but more broadly sweeping, the blueprints really for everything that unfolds over the course of Israelite history on some level happened to our ancestors. And so the ways in which we contend with our realities were, is gonna be drawn from the tools that Tanakh provides us. And way we respond as a nation to events is gonna be based on the ways that our ancestors responded to similar challenges, similar conflicts, similar events. Okay? And so again, because the Avot were individuals and what happened to them becomes essentially microcosm or the example. And what we do is we look at our ancestors and we understand that we are not just the literal extension of the events of their lives, but of the metaphors as well. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a quiz so that you can understand what I'm talking about because all this sounds a little bit theoretical. But if I said to you, okay, here's your quiz and you could unmute yourselves or type it in, whatever's easier. I'm gonna start a story and as students of Tanakh, you're gonna finish it, okay? Once upon a time, there are two brothers. There's an older brother and there's a younger brother. And there's a competition between them, who wins? You tell me, younger brother, older brother, who gets chosen? Younger. Right, right. the younger brother gets chosen. And if you look all the way, right, go all the way back to every example in Tanakh that you can think of, Right, start with the sons of Avraham and then the sons of Yitzhak and then the sons of Yaakov and then Moshe and then uh, Shmuel and then David. All of our leaders on some level, right, whenever there's a younger brother and an older brother, Tanakh almost inverts primogenitor, right? The assumption that the older brother should rule. And you will be hard pressed to find, I, I challenge you to find, okay, a chosen that was not actually the younger brother, that was not the obvious choice. So what we need to look at, right, the fact that it's so obvious, what we need to ask is not why was David chosen, right? David was chosen because he was worthy to be chosen from all his other brothers. What we want to ask is why Tanakh keeps repeating this theme. What's this idea of the younger brother replacing the older coming to teach us as a nation of Israel? Right? So in order to understand actually this phenomenon, we need to go back and remember, again, we're thinking on the metaphorical level, most societies in the ancient world had myths that linked their very beginnings. I spoke about how important myths were in the ancient world. So most people started with the myths, just like we have stories. We say Avram Avinu was our ancestor and Hashem spoke to him and he told him to go to Eretz Kanaan. And that's our origin stories. Most societies in the ancient worlds don't link their origins to an actual person. They link their origins to the very beginnings of the world. Because in the ancient world, the antiquity of a nation or the ability of a nation to trace its roots back to primordial times lent that group a, de a degree of authority and nobility that was really revered in the ancient world. Okay? So if you think about it, right, we're unique. Israel is unique because we're one of the few ancient cultures that actually doesn't equate the origins of the world with our national beginnings. The creation stories at the beginning of Breshit are universal. They don't talk about the, our birthplace. We trace our birth all the way in back to the mid 20th century BCE, right? By Avram who shows up late on the, on the scene. And Tanakh is very open about the fact that the the land was already inhabited by lots of nations of impressive size and distinction. And so if you think about it, and by the way, fast forward, not only do we not trace our age back all the way back as the other nations, our beginnings are far from illustrious, right? We basically become a nation after a long stint of slavery in, in Egypt. And if we compare our stories to the other ancient cultures that existed, it would have been interpreted as a sign of inferiority or a point of weakness, okay? So by the way, the only other culture, and this is actually a fascinating, uh, only other ancient culture that did not, um, was not considered ancient were actually the Greeks and they compensated for it with all of their sense of political superiority, right? So everyone has their ways of compensating. But one of the things that Tanakh addresses head on are those elements of our history that aren't flattering or that could be perceived based on the way ancients conceived of the world as, as blemishes by society's standards. And so then Tanakh takes 
specific details about the stories of our ancestors and uses it to show how those negative stereotypes are actually not negative at all. And what it does is it creates a new framework for understanding those elements of our past that may seem troubling to us. So the most obvious example that I gave, right, the younger brother motif that's threaded not just through Breshid, as I mentioned, not through all of Tanakh, one of the things that we notice is that the often older, physically stronger brother does not, is not chosen because God wills it to be otherwise. And then it's always the younger chosen, more befitting character that ends up transcending everyone else around him. And so the reader of these narratives, when we read these stories about the scrawny David, about the Ishtam Yoshev Ohalim, who doesn't look like he's gonna be the one to lead, but Hashem chooses him. So then we walk away with more than just a knowledge of our ancestors. We walk away with our understanding that being God's chosen compensates or more than compensates for youth and for birth order. So there's something really, really fascinating when we start looking at Tanakh, not just for details of what happened, but also for what they symbolize and the way in which Tanakh takes potentially negative concepts and then packages them in a way that those ideas actually become part and parcel of what make us unique. Okay? So there's something fascinating. Here's my next quiz, okay, because you guys did so well on the first one. Um, if I tell you there is a very, very important person who's going to make real, leave a mark on history. And you know one thing about his mother. What is it? What do you know about his mother? She was barren for many years. Okay, right. Excellent. It's the birth of the hero motif, right? When we look at some of the most important figures in our history, their birth is preceded by some form of struggle to conceive and then bring them to life. So we have Yitzhak and Yaakov and Yosef and Shmuel and Shimshon. And again, we're reframing the question. We're not asking why those women were barren, right? Barrenness is, was certainly um, something that women, str women struggle with certainly today. And in the ancient world before we had modern medicine, even more so. We're not asking why the women were barren. What we're asking is if at the end of the day, the children were born. So then why is the Tanakh providing us with so many details about that struggle to conceive along the way, right? There are so many details I wish I knew about Sarah Imenu. There's a million things I wish someone had actually written a really good biography of Sarah Imenu that I'll, I'll never know, right? But I do know about her struggle to have a child. And that's also one of the only things I know about Chana and the, one of the only things I know about the mother of Shimshon. And so the question is why the emphasis on this? Right? So again, if we think more in terms of metaphor, and more in terms of these compensatory elements. I mentioned that when we look back at the early history of our nation, right, our birth took a very, very long time. Hashem promised Avram in Yadoa Teda, you're gonna have Reiki Geri Yazarachada Eretz Lolahem. Hashem promised Avram he's gonna be the father of the great nation. But then our birth as a nation didn't come until after a very long protracted struggle. We were slaves and then we became a nation at the foot of this mountain in the barren wasteland of the desert, right? That's a far cry from the grandiose mythological beginnings of our counterparts, right? But again, if we look back at the type scenes of barrenness and Tanakh, one of the things we notice is that in each and every case, if sometimes even only retroactively, divine intervention is explicit and the long awaited period of barrenness leads to the birth of one of our most venerated heroes that goes on to accomplish feats literally of epic proportions often. Right? And the implication of that metaphor becomes clear. The theme of barrenness helps make sense of the role that God plays in the promise of the birth as a nation and of our future. And the difficulties, rather than undermining the nature of the promise that God made, actually serve to highlight it, right? Sarah, who's so old and biologically should not be able to have children anymore, look what happens to her. And so if we extend that to us as a nation, how powerful could that image be, okay? Now, one of the most important birth stories in Tanakh is actually the story of Moshe. Okay, because of course we know that Hashem establishes a covenant with the Avot, that it's the birth of Moshe that sort of heralds that relationship or that transition to the national level. Now, the birth of Moshe, what's really, really interesting, I just went on this long, right? I just, I just spoke for 20 minutes about the birth, the birth of the hero motif and the barrenness and everything else. The birth of Moshe doesn't actually fit into the birth of the hero motif. 
right? If you think about it, actually, there was a time, though, when the birth of Moshe was in question or was threatened. And so difficulty conceiving, it's not just the crux of the issue. There wasn't a biological barrenness in the story of Moshe, but the birth of Moshe was not guaranteed. And so Moshe too defies, or the birth of Moshe defies expectations of a different reality, okay? or, or a different variety. And so what I want to look at is why on the one hand, right, is Tanakh utilizing this well-known motif that we discuss, and yet at the same time, breaking with the type scene, what does this variant model of the difficulty prior to birth communicate to us? Right? And the last question, if we think about it, the impediment to Moshe's birth stemmed from society's expectations of what the people central to Moshe's birth were capable of. Okay? In particular, in this case, as we're going to see, the women in the story. And so we want to look at all those details and try to understand what's happening. So if we look back at the backstory of Moshe, okay, we see a king who's threatened. I have, sorry, my apologies. Let me just pop up the sources because I have most of it here. Again, I'm not going to, I don't want to hold you guys over on a Sunday morning. So I have most of it up here. Um, the English, if anyone wants to, I have the Hebrew, I can't do both on the screen at once, but if anyone wants to uh, look at the English translation is right beneath it. What we have in the backstory of Moshe, okay, is a king threatened by what he perceives to be the proliferation of the Hebrews and his fears of this potential insurrection, right? What am I going to do if they start having all these kids and then they're going to overthrow us? And so he reacts essentially in three phases. And the way I broke down those paragraphs in Tanakh is from Parak Aleph in, in Shemot. And it's the three phases that Paro uh, institutes in order to prevent this, you know, uncontrollable proliferation of these, of these Hebrews. Initially, he contempts, right? He, he attempts to conscript the people for these large public works. Right? Let's send them to work. Let's make them build, build pyramids in the hopes of keeping them busy. But then he sees, right? It says, right? Um, it says that the harder he worked them, right? Pen, right? The, uh, as hard as he worked them, it didn't matter. They just kept having kids, right? Came near Boo. So when he sees that the labor itself, while it's intensive, is not enough to crush the potential spirit of revolution. So he does the next days. He intensifies the work and he embitters their lives with the hopes of crushing their spirits and suppressing that desire to reproduce and bring children into the world. But none of it works. And so finally, he turns to the midwives. And there's something interesting being communicated in the psukim, I think, right? There's, and if you actually look at it, oh, sorry, I just, my, my sheet just popped away from me for one second. Sorry about that. So if you look actually, just tell me if I put it up on the screen, can you still see it or is it too small? Do you see the screen? Hold on, let me just make it bigger. because. I'm going to put these two uh, portions up here. Okay, one of the things I bolded, you'll see, is what we call a mila mancha. It means a word that's repeated over and over, right, within a given section. And what it does when we look at that word, when we see that word over and over, is it gives us the ability to recognize something that the author, something that the Torah wants us to pay attention to. One of the things that we notice is that in Parak Aleph, Paro fears the birth of boys. Right? He wants the ben, get rid of the boys because they're dangerous. If it's a girl, ah, all right, girls are innocuous, right? What are, what, what's a girl going to do? And so he only wants to kill the boys. Now, if you look at the midwives, and by the way, it's a very interesting debate for a second time, it's for a separate time. It's not clear from the syntax whether they were male dot ha'ivriot, meaning they were, they were Hebrew midwives or they were just midwives to the Hebrews, right? Do we have righteous Gentiles here or do we have Hebrews defending their own, right? Either way, the story of the male dot, regardless of their ethnicity, is a story about women, right, whose job it is to birth children and who to see to it that babies are born healthy and that the mothers stay healthy. Paro makes the assumption, which is sort of an extension of his first assumption, right? Ah, what are girls gonna do? He makes the assumption that these midwives are weak and they're feeble. And he, if he tells them to kill the babies, they're gonna do that. Now we know right, that the midwives refuse to obey. 
And when their disobedience is questioned, they play right into Paro's preconceived gender and racial stereotypes, right? They, what, us, what, what are you talking about? No, Paro, of course we're on your side, right? But what happens is the term as soon as we get to the house, you know, these Hebrews, they're like animals. They're right. They play into his racist anxieties. They're like animals. They're like subhuman animals that give birth in the wild. They don't even wait for us to come. They manipulate Paro preconceived assumptions and in that way are able to defy the king and in that way they're able to secure the life of Moshe and so the very women that Paro assumed would be insignificant in his historical calculations end up being the ones that come together to birth Moshe and then fast forward and you have Miriam hiding in the reeds watching over her brother not leaving until she knows what's going to happen to him and then you have the way she intervenes with the daughter of Paro and ensures that her own mother nurses Moshe, right? And he's only sent back to the palace after he's weaned. And so if you look at that Milam Ancha as it appears in those two first sections, you have, we see the dichotomy between who Paro feared, and the Tanakh is forcing us to see this by using that word over and over, there's that dichotomy, there's that gap between who Paro feared and who Tanakh is actually saying, maybe Paro should have actually considered, Right, as as someone as people to think about. You have that Mila Ben and then the Mila Bat. And the irony, of course, being that as Paro broadens his decree, first it's Ben, a specific Ben, and then he exp expands it to Kol Ben Hailod. As Paro expands his decree to more and more and more Banim, the ba the Bat or the Banot are getting closer and closer and closer to home. And I don't have to write, I think all of us can appreciate the irony, especially considering the use of this Mila Mancha, where that very last Pasuk right there in Pasuk Yud, right? It says, Vaigdal Hayeled, but to the Ehu Levat Paro, Moshe grows up, he's brought to the daughter of Paro, right? There's that Mila Mancha, but this time it's his own daughter, Vayihila Leven. And she became, and he became for her a son. Okay, so we don't need any more powerful irony or use of that Mila Mancha to see exactly what the Tanakh is talking about. Okay. But now here, I'm going to ask you guys again. There were, so let's say we have the Mialdot, we have the mother of Moshe, we have the sister of Moshe, and we have Bat Paro, five women saving him. Who else saves Moshe's life? There's another woman in Moshe's life that saves his life. Who is it? And it's this tiny little enigmatic episode that happens in the end of Parak Vav that most people don't even know what to do with. So most of us just skip right over it because it actually makes very, very little sense. And Parsha Nimar spend pages and pages with Mikro Dolo trying to make sense of it. Okay. If you see, and I lost my sheet again. If you have at the very end of Parak Vav, sorry, it keeps jumping. Uh, sorry, not Parak Vav, Parak Dalid, my apologies. At the very, very end of Parak Dalid in Shemot, this is in the the on Moshe's way back. Ah, okay, thank you, Tzipora, right? Moshe's way back. Moshe already saw uh, uh, Hashem at the Sne. Hashem already spoke to him. He appointed him. Moshe didn't want to go. Hashem says, you have to go. Ultimately, Moshe goes back, but we have the sense that there's that Moshe's reticent. We have the sense that he's apprehensive because Hashem at the burning bush has to give him one sign after the next to sort of, uh, you know, bolster his, his confidence and the ability to go. We have this tiny little enigmatic episode that I'm not going to read inside, but you have it there on your pages, where um, it's not entirely clear who God wants to kill, but it says that Moshe, his wife, and the baby stop off at a malone, at a hotel on, or an inn, on the way back to, uh, to Mitzrayim, and it says God wants to kill, right? It says, Va, Ugh, I don't know why my sources keep jumping up, my apologies. It says, um, and it says there that Hashem wanted to kill him. Now, it's not entirely clear the pronoun, who the him is, okay? But Hashem, we, am, we assume, according to most parshanim, Hashem wanted to kill Moshe. And so it says, verse 25, Zipporah takes a flint rock, very, a very sharp flint rock. She gives her own son a brit milah, implying that for some reason Moshe had not performed a brit milah on his own son, right? There's lots of very, very reasonable explanations, but for whatever reason, Zipporah understood that God wants to kill Moshe for that. And so she, she throws the foreskin and it hits one of their feet, probably Moshe's feet, and she declares Declares he's a bridegroom, and it says Bayoref Nimenu, and Hashem or the the uh, whatever being it was that came to take Moshe's life disappears. Okay, 
Now, if we go back, okay, um, one of the things that's very, very interesting um, is when we're first introduced to Tzipora at the well, right, we're made to understand again that society, if you remember all the daughters of, the, of Yitro are at the well and the, and the men are there and they're sort of bullying them and Moshe steps in and he says, hey, what are you doing? And he gets them the water. That scene also, right, sort of gives the sense that the men at the well want the water and so they take advantage of the women that appear powerless, the women that didn't appear to have the strength to exert power when it was needed. And yet here, when God is coming to kill Moshe Rabbeinu, it was Tzipora's quick thinking that saved his life and enabled the next phase of Jewish history. And so in the birth story of Moshe, we're not watching a woman challenge God to open her womb the way we did in so many of the other stories in Tanakh, right? But what we're watching in the story of Moshe is a cohort of women really working together, some knowingly, some unknowingly, to challenge society's expectations of them and in doing so to secure the birth and the life who's, of the man who's responsible for the birth of our nation. And that's a fantastic beginning. Again, if you just imagine Sefer Shemot starting, that a, son, a child was born, Moshe, he ran, out of, he ran out of Egypt, and then Hashem appeared to him at the burning bush. We wouldn't think that anything was missing. But Tanakh spends the entire first two prakim focused on this cohort of women that enables Moshe's birth and Moshe's success. Okay? Now, I'm going back now to the myth of Isis and Osiris that we started with. Okay? Linguistically, there's lots of similarities between them. Ah, my sheet, I don't know why my computer is not behaving tonight. Um, if you go back to the myth of Isis and Osiris, I'm just gonna read to you. It says, when Seth went searching for Horus, still a child in his hiding place in Kamis, the Delta marshland, after his mother Isis had hidden him in a papyrus thicket and her sister Nephthys had spread her mat over him. What does that remind you of? That she places him in a papyrus thicket and her sister's watching over him. Right? So I hope most of you are thinking of the scene of Moshe being placed in Nile. So like the Torah did with other myths, and by the way, I want to be really, really clear. This is not questioning the authenticity of the Moshe story. There was an infanticidal decree, and so probably many mothers put their children in the Nile hoping someone would have mercy on them, right? This is not that the Torah is making up this story, but the question we're always asking is not did it happen. We're asking why did the Torah record this detail of Moshe's early life? But if we go back and think about it, what the Torah is doing is what it did with those other myths that we looked at. That, right? It includes those details in the Torah that happened, right, of course, but that also make a point. In Egyptian myths, the myth of Isis and the myth of Osiris, what we saw without even realizing it is that only deities can wrestle with other deities. Only goddesses can protect the chosen hero. Right? But if we look and, and by the way, I'll just show you on the sheet here. If you look at some of the images here, you have the various images of that myth depicted. Right, it's the goddess watching over the hero. Okay. What do you notice in that bottom picture, by the way? Or I, I'll say this, look for the Isis. Tell me what you see in that bottom picture. Who do you think Isis is? I'll give you a hint. If they were to translate Isis into Tanakh Hebrew, even though this is not accurate at all linguistically, they may call her Tsipora. Right? She's presented there as the bird. That's how she's presented in ancient Egyptian lore. Okay? But what Tanakh is doing right, is utilizing images that were understood one way in the ancient world. They're taking the way that Isis was depicted in the myths about her, and then it's making clear, it's taking those very details that the Torah includes in the story of Moshe, all the details ignored, right? The scant details that are provided show Moshe being watched over by his brave sister, which you have right there in the first one, being nursed by his mother, which was one of the most prominent images of Isis, and then saved from death from his wife, Tzipora, the bird hovering over and making sure that he was okay. And so when we take all these ideas together, what Yitziat Mitzrayim, that phase in our history, is really all about Hashem and his unparalleled powers in the universe and his ability to perform miraculous deeds. That we know. That's what the Makot is all about. But what the Tanakh is making clear and pause, forcing us to consider at the beginning of the miracles God brings is that 
It also, re miracles require humans to set things in motion. We saw it with the Makot, we saw it at Yam Suf, and it goes back to that early myth that I spoke about at the very, very beginning of this class, right? Where Hashem tells humanity that when he placed us, when he created us, the Tzalem Elohim, and he placed us on this earth, he wasn't waiting for demigods to do the work. Hashem was charging us with being partners with him. And so in rejecting the prevalent theology that when the Torah was given, what Tanakh is making very clear, just like it did in Bereshit when it created humanity, is that human beings partner with God in the salvation and in the empowerment of our heroes and in the unfolding of our history. And so if you look back at ancient Egypt, it always, they needed demigods to save the demigods to fight the powers that be. And in Tanakh, you need human beings that are kind and choose to do the right thing and choose to be brave in the face of tyranny to do the right thing. And then Hashem comes in and partners with those human beings. Okay. I, I want to show you, um, this may be one of the most, I think, uh, powerful images. I promised you all, it's act, this actually is a share about Yom Yerushalayim. Um, this is actually 19, this is not from 1967. Um, it's one of the most powerful, in my opinion, one of the most powerful images from the 20th century, um, at least as it pertains to the land that we call home, right? The 20th century, just like Paro had one thing to say about the women in Egypt. So the 20th century, uh, or really I would say the better part of 2000 years, the world had something to say about Jews. Right? The world had its own assumptions about Jews and their powerlessness, and it had its own stereotypes. And then if you look at this man who has the number still on his arm from the concentration camps, but he's holding a gun and he's protecting his homeland. Okay? I don't know if you guys can see it. I hope it's big enough. You see, ah, that's too big. You have this man okay, who essentially decided to defy those expectations. So he has the number on his arm, which is a constant reminder of where others thought he belonged. But having seen what he saw, we can imagine, right? And understanding that the future of his people from there on in lay in his hands. So if that meant standing behind the barrel of a gun to ensure that the people would never be helpless again, that's what he picked, that's what he decided to do. And we're talking now more specifically about Yom Yerushalayim. You know, I was not alive. I, I imagine some of you on this Zoom were. Right? The world assumed that the people of Israel would end up in the Mediterranean. That's, and, and the people of Israel were terrified that that would happen. But once again, the people of Israel defied the expectations and the assumptions, and they refused to listen to, ironically, right, what Egyptian radio was saying about them. And so they, like the women of Shemot, they knew that there were vulnerable people relying on them, that there were people depending on them for survival, and so they did everything within their power to protect them. And so as students of history, because we look back, as I said, at the stories of what happened to our ancestors to understand what's happening in real time as students of Tanakh and as students of history, we know not to take the miraculous component for granted, that goes without saying, right? But, and, and we know clearly to look for God's hand in it, but we see that sacred partnership. We see that our entire belief system and humanity's purpose is founded upon manifested in 1967 with Shikhrur Yerushalayim. So, you know, I think I'll, I'll finish with one other thing that I think is really, really important. There's one other piece of our birth story in Egypt that gets missed. Um, one more way in which the birth story of Moshe breaks the mold. And, and I, I actually wasn't going to include this piece in the interest of time, but um, watching the news the last couple of days and, and sort of with the fallout, I think of everything that happened uh, over the weekend, I think maybe this is even more important than thinking about our strength, um, is thinking about what happens. It's not just about people breaking the mold. Um, I recently heard a speech, there was a Eliezer Shekti, who is the, uh, he was the head of the Israeli Air Force when Israel attacked Iraq's nuclear um, nuclear reactor. So he did a Zoom for, for the high school boys in, in my, my, that my son is in. Um, and he taught, and this guy knows about uh, existential threats. Right? He knows about what it is to defend Israel. He knows what it is to have to be strong. But he was talking to this group of high school boys and they have their entire careers in the army not far off. And he said to them straight away, he said, the greatest existential threat to the Jewish state is the conflict and the enmity between the different factions and the different segments of society. And he said, we can have the greatest air force in the world, but the greatest weakness of our state is the manifestation of different ideologies when it extends beyond discourse. 
So, you know, I would argue the same holds true for the Jewish people as a whole, right? We have a very colored, tumultuous history. But if there's one thing we learned from the story of the women that worked together to save Moshe, if you compare it to all the other birth stories, so many of the other birth stories involve strife, naturally, between women. We have Sarah and Hagar, we have Rachel and Leah, we have Hannah and Penina, and not just strife, but the repercussions of that strife that persists beyond the lives of the mothers. But the success of the women in Mitzrayim is because for the first time in history, when the birth of a child was, was in question, these women work together and they band together and it's the cooperation of those women, conscious and unconscious, that, that I think we as readers recognize and that was able to bring their uh, efforts really to fruition. So I think, um, you know, I, th I think Yom Yerushalayim, um, for me personally at least, I, I think it's a birth story like all others. And I think, you know, we mentioned at the beginning that Tanakh doesn't provide us with a comprehensive history, it provides us with a lens to view our history so that when we look at Yom Yerushalayim, we know what to look for. And so when we think about Yom Yerushalayim, we see a war that was won against unbeatable odds. No one's going to argue with that. And if we read the accounts and the interviews with soldiers that went out to the front lines, the overwhelming impression that we walk away with is that they went out to fight simply because people were depending on them and because the, the borders of our country, quite literally, the survival of the Jewish state was depending on them. And so regardless of what anyone thought, they knew and they went out. And of course, as Tanakh has shown, God then, when humans take the initiative, Hashem couples with them and matches those efforts. And so I think that as students of Tanakh, really, um, our job is to learn from the past and to use that understanding of, of all the things that are going on and all the things that are at play that lead us to our successes in the past and to always keep those in mind and draw from them so that when history throws things at us, we know what we're looking at, we, under, we know what we're supposed to believe, we know what to keep in mind, and, and we know how to ensure this, the, the thriving uh, survival of the Jewish people. So with that, I wanted to wish you a Yom Yerushalayim Sameach. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time left, but please, by all means, open up the, the floor to questions if anyone has or. Well, first, thank you very much, Yesher Koach. Uh, definitely opened up new portals of understanding. The connection between the myth and the babies. I mean, just, you know, we don't look at Tanakh in that way, but it really gives a much deeper appreciation for as you say, uh, moving away from the mythology, but really in a very subtle way. I think, as you said as well, appreciating what uh, Hashem's ultimate mission for us is, is to be partners in redemption. Yeah. Any questions, please, by all means. Ah, I just saw Tzipora popped up in the chat. So someone saw the uh, bird in the, in the images. Yeah. <laughs> All right. If not, feel free. You can give out my email address if any questions, you know, That'd come be great. up later. Can you actually also um, send me and I'll share it with people the copy of that photo um, that you yeah, showed? It's on, the, it's on the original sources that I sent you. It's there. Oh, it is. Okay. So I'll look in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, a t this is, I'm a terrible academic. I don't have the, I don't think I put the source on there. If you need it, I could find it. Sorry, you won't get sued, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get sued. I didn't send it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but thank you very much. This is a you know very uh, moving uh, talk in preparation for thinking about Yom Yerushalayim and uh, in our role. You are one hundred percent correct. For like eighty percent of this year, I had no idea what the connection was to Yom Yerushalayim. <laughs> Pulled it together really well. So That's it. You. That's it. No spoilers. You just got to build. You got to build to the. <laughs> and last thing, about Sarah Malka did email us. She really appreciated the class she had with you. She said oh. Mishkan and Beis Hamigdash. It started. Oh, that's an old one. Yeah, that's good. That's a fun class. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We share Basarotovo. Thanks. Really, for really, my pleasure. Yes, Basarotovo to everyone. Oh, bye, Fishers. <laughs>